Welcome back. This is GameShark TV. This is hopefully my name. And this is what's coming up in part two. Jazz hands. The rest of this month's releases get a good going over in our review roundup. And there's a look ahead at some big games coming out this year, including the lowdown on the latest reincarnations of FIFA and Pro Evo. It's been a long old summer for football fans who've had an excruciating wait for action as Liverpool have bought up every British midfielder with a pulse and some who frankly haven't even got one of those and says Fabregas reignites his hot and heavy fling with Barcelona. But now the season has finally kicked off, it's time for the next generation of footballing games to stake their claims for greatness. So let's take a look at what Pro Evo and FIFA have in their latest starting lineups. Following significant development, FIFA's main innovation this year is its impact engine. Not just a series of sadistic ways to bulldoze your opposition to the floor, word from EA has it that collisions on and off the ball will dramatically affect the flow of the match. It also feeds into a more intricate injury system which will allow for more realistic knocks and twangs and is therefore the best reason yet not to pick Arsenal as your team of choice. Containing attackers without physical contact should also be easier, relying less on a button to summon an AI teammate and giving you more control over how players are closed down. Likewise, precision dribbling comes into effect. No more will you find yourself attempting to haphazardly storm past defenders by knocking the ball past them and running like hell. Instead, it will automatically switch to a slower and more controlled dribbling option once you get close to the defender. Much more has also been made of skill attributes, with particular attention paid to vision. Better players will be able to pick out more subtle opportunities in play. Wingers should have a keener sense of their surroundings too, no longer moronically dribbling the ball over the touchline, instead using close control to minimise positional brain farts. If they see a player in the box who specialty is heading the ball, they'll be more likely to ping in a cross, whereas they'll opt to pass it along the floor if the player in the centre is a four-foot decapitated midget, or Theo Walcott. The career mode gets another overhaul this year, the big focus being on managing the press and your players' egos. If a squad member feels he's not playing enough, he'll let you know. Ignore him at your peril, as the unhappier he gets, the worse his performances are likely to become. Transfer markets are more nuanced, as some clubs will chase the big players, whereas others will focus on a bit of wheeling and dealing, and postpone offers to the deadline to see what else transpires first. Pro Evo this year is more about building on the changes from last year than redesigning the wheel. Overhauled AI should mean that your fellow players will make runs to give you space rather than just homing in on the ball. And there's a new impact engine similar to FIFA's. Along with closer control and ironing out some bugs, the biggest implementation is the ability to control two players at once, elevating playing with yourself to a new art form. Clicking the right stick in a teammate's direction will allow you to control his run. In theory, this will mean you can tear apart the opposition with the kind of passing that AI would blindly ignore. In practice, this looks slightly tricky to pull off, but with the welter of other skill options available to Pro Evo players, once mastered, this could well create the best and most intelligent simulation of playing in a team yet, cutting out dodgy AI completely. For the veteran football gamer, Konami is clearly intent on giving you the most detailed way to mold the game on your own. Beyond that, it's business as usual at Pro Evo. Sadly, some of the main leagues remain mired in license-free oblivion, although the Champions League makes a welcome return. Last year's effort was generally a blast to play, so here's hoping the small polishes Konami have made will add up to the most serious and nuanced Pro Evo yet. Apparently, it has laid down an ancient and irrefutable law that no man shall play video games in July and August, which leaves the pickings particularly slim on the shelves this month. Since games publishers have clearly never experienced an English summer, we've put together the best of a very scraggly bunch with which to while away those rainy days in front of the TV. While never quite becoming household names, the first two Call of Juarez games were solid enough forays into rarefied western genre. This time round, horses have been replaced by SUVs and six shooters by Uzis as the series comes bang up to date in what's being billed as a modern day western. In reality, it's nothing of the sort, instead coming across as a preposterous 80s action movie, replete with such touchstones as exploding helicopters and liberal use of the word muddy funster, not to mention the body count that makes Bad Boys 2 look like Brideshead Revisited. Such is the relentlessness of the carnage, it's almost a satire on the futility of the war on drugs. In this game, that war is being fought against a titular Mexican cartel by three maverick cops, namely sassy FBI agent Kim Evans, dodgy DEA operative Eddie Guerra, and grizzled Vietnam veteran 
Ben the Call, a distant relative of Reverend Ray from the previous games. Once you've chosen your character, you stick with them throughout the game, with the other two playable cooperatively on a drop-in, drop-out basis. Missions mainly take place in the mean streets of LA, packed with pimps, whores, pushers and strippers, and while it's almost monotonously explosive, some intrigue is offered by the overlapping story of the three characters. The multiplayer offers little originality other than a rudimentary buddy system, and overall it's a mainly tawdry piece of entertainment. Nevertheless, it keeps you coming back for more, perhaps proof that bad games can be good. With little flying onto the shelves at the moment, it's up to the download-only titles to step up to the plate, and Bastion does so with style. Playing as a kid abandoned in a world that's all but destroyed by the mysteriously unexplained calamity, you must hack, shoot and pulverise your way through a series of imaginative monsters to rebuild the fallen civilization. This makes for a fascinating action RPG, enhanced by some gorgeous hand-painted design and atmospherically drawling country and western music. Best of all, your actions are narrated throughout, told as if from a storybook, adding a nice line in warm humour and narrative involvement, like you're writing the story as it goes along. Cinder brick style sure goes down smooth, then stays in your gut like a rock. Weaponry comes in the usual flavours of throwing, shooting and bludgeoning, but all upgrade in a neatly idiosyncratic manner. Quirkily powered potions increase character abilities, but the real genius is in the way upgrades can be used to alter the difficulty. Some will give you greater experience points, but make your enemies faster and harder to kill. It all binds together to make Bastion that rarest of things, an addictive, immersive and stunningly designed game that's well worth every penny. Back in the mists of time! Otherwise known as the 1990s, so-called god games were all the rage in the PC, with genre pioneer Peter Molyneux's seminal populace leading the way. From Dust is a thinly failed tribute to that game, with one of the levels cunningly titled Swenilom, which our crack team of backward readers have deciphered as spelling out Pete. As for the game, it takes the god concept back to basics, with none of the micromanagement that dogged later incarnations. Following the story of an ancient shamanic tribe, your only on-screen presence is a tadpole-like cursor known as the Breath, with which you can manipulate the landscape, picking up great swathes of earth, water, lava, and in later levels, exploding trees. A constant battle against the elements you have to protect your citizens, five of whom are required to form a village, which then enables them to learn a new skill. Rerouting rivers, building walls from lava and bridges from dirt, it's essentially a geology simulator with a mystical tail thrown on top. But as levels become more complicated, it becomes something of a plate spinning exercise as you frantically tend to different areas of the map. Nobody said it was easy being God. Not to leave you with a downer, but as autumn spreads its gloomy shadow over what is frankly a sorry excuse for a summer, the clamour for the more prestigious titles in the pipeline becomes more and more deafening. Following years of derision for its shaky sequels, Driver makes its belated return finally, while Assassin's Creed will be hoping to avoid consumer burnout with its third title in as many years. Here's how they're shaping up so far. Hi, I'm Steve Hill. This, as ever, is GameShock TV. We're here for the Ubisoft Summer Seaside Spectacular in West London, Noah Nera Beach. Uh, they've got ice cream and video games. Uh, Driver San Francisco, I believe. Um, where's that set, then? Uh, <laughs> well, it's, we, we decided on San Francisco very quickly, partly because it was the, in the first game, wanted to return to the roots of the original game in many ways, handling city, characters, story. And, uh, and, so, yeah, and, and also, it's one of the most diverse driving environments in the US. The driver itself has developed in all sorts of uh, different ways, because we started off... Uh, we were the first open city driving uh, driving game. Then Driver 2 was the first game to feature the getting out of cars and into other cars. We expanded that in Driver 3, but we didn't really polish the, the out of car sections as much as we would have liked to. Driving sections we were happy with. And now we've retreated from that. We don't have the out of car sections. Totally focused on the driving. Obviously we have the new uh, feature shift, but, uh, but a real refocus on the driving. So in Driver San Francisco, you spend the vast majority of your time uh, Driving. We have 130 real licensed cars, uh, 
fully destructible, but we do have the shift feature, which is the ability of a player to, um, to move between, to shift between multiple cars uh, rapidly, instantaneously, even from one side of the city to the other side of the city with no loading, no delays. Um, people are playing the multiplayer, how does that work? It sounds very much like the school game tag. Yeah, it's a very, uh, it's a very simple game. It's, uh, at, at, its, at its core, what you have to do is you have to uh, get a, a, a hold of attack. You score one point for every uh, one second. First player to 100 points, but if you get hit by someone uh, when you have the tag, you lose it. If you uh, crash into them again, you get the tag back again. And as I said, first person to 100. So there's lots and lots of, of shifting as people shift around to try and grab the, uh, the tag. Two of the main improvements that we will have uh, in the game is the Oak Blade, which is a new weapon as you can use. Also uh, as a tool for navigation that allows him to climb faster, ride zip line, and as a weapon it creates a bridge between the navigation and the combat. The other big element that we are introducing is the bomb crafting. Throughout the game the player will be able to collect a variety of ingredients and with them he will be able to craft bombs that will fit his play style. We uh, have again the multiplayer aspect for the second iteration of it. It was introduced in Brotherhood and since uh, then we really pay a close attention, attention to the player feedback. We are making sure that it will have a better connectivity with friends, uh, better matchmaking, but also we are adding a lot of new contents in it. Uh, customization of your character, new maps, new game modes, and as well as a new series of assassination available in the multiplayer. Well, that's all we got time for this month, but as sure as night follows day and old vegetables turn into that disgusting brown liquid you find at the bottom of your fridge, we'll be back next month with more from gaming's electronic wonderland. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'm off to drink that disgusting brown liquid you find at the bottom of your fridge. Mmm, nutritious. See you next time.